Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it, and if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to Manage Vets Consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of The Bend, where we ask our guests to share their bends in the road and some of those monkey wrenches that life throws at us. And so today, my guest is Dr. Philip Richman, and and Philip has a lot of initials behind his name, so we'll ask him to explain uh, those, but he is, at this current point in time, the Chief Medical and Team Wellbeing Officer at Veterinary United, and this is a new job for Phil, so he just is getting ready to get into that. Um, he is an advocate for positive culture and individual team and organizational psychological health, safety, and well-being in veterinary workplaces. This is where we are so simpatico here. <laughs> He both leads and is involved in state, national, and international projects for the advancement of well-being and culture in veterinary medicine. He serves as the chair for both the Florida Veterinary Medical Association's Outreach and Professional Well-Being Committees, and is a member advisor for several national committees and boards for workplace suicide prevention and veterinary well-being, including those sponsored by the CDC, the National Institutes of Health, and the um, AFSP, Fear Free Mentor Vet, Appalachian State University. Go apps, right? Mm -hmm. From North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Dr. Richmond is a speaker, published writer, frequent veterinary podcast guest, again, and holds multiple certifications in the field of applied positive psychology, appreciative inquiry, workplace well-being, psychological health and safety, trauma-informed workplaces, resilience, training, behavior change, and suicide prevention, he was awarded the FVMA Gold Star for service in 2019 and FVMA Veterinary of the Year in 2021. Man, you're big stuff here. Thank you for coming on my <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so getting to, like, getting to be oh, with you. I'm getting to be with you. Oh my goodness. Thank you. You know what? I love the sign behind you that says, be curious, not judgmental. Yep. Uh, one of my favorite things to tell people is be curious, not furious, right? Just go ahead and start asking questions, asking questions, and then shut up <laughs> because right. you need to listen to the answer. So I'm going to ask you some questions. So now tell us how you got started. What's your origin story? We mentioned we were talking oh, a little bit about it yeah. beforehand. Yeah, so I, I grew up in the uh, booming metropolis of Castleberry, Florida, uh, so about 15, 20 minutes outside of Orlando. And grew up with my folks, uh, my folks loved me a ton. Um, we just, we didn't have a lot of financial resources um, growing up. My dad had had a heart attack and couldn't, couldn't work. And my mom, my mom uh, was a groomer. And so she worked at one of the local animal hospitals as a groomer, but then also a receptionist. So I got to, you know, early on, uh, you know, as a kid, I got to go in and out of animal hospitals. And of course we grew you know, I had ducks and like, a lot of, you know, I had ducks. We had cats. Uh, we grew up. We had a horse that we found by the side of the road that, you know, I, I got, so I got to ride, but we were always like the redheaded stepchildren. Cause we didn't, you know, the barn that I was at, we didn't have any money and, you know, we're riding with all the, all the. Uh, yeah. That's, folks. that's but like anyhow. a, right. A horse is like a boat. You just throw money. Woo! In. Yeah. yeah right? We were. Yeah. So God bless. Like I, I get it. Like everybody. And I, loved riding but then uh anyway i quit quit riding about about the time i was in middle school i think and started playing football and all that type of type of jazz so i was in i i had so this will this will go into the next part of uh the story kind of but so i was i went to university of florida had a rotc scholarship full ride and uh, i was gonna be an officer in the in the army and lost that scholarship my freshman year because uh i partied a lot and, uh, you know, and didn't go to school, didn't go to class. And, um, that was, that was a lot of my story. So of course my folks, folks didn't have a lot of financial resources. So I went, we had to move back home and they were like, well, you're going to have to get, 
loans um, to uh, you know pay for school. So I went to community college and then started you know as got a job working actually as a research assistant for my dad's cardiology group, which got me more interested in medicine um, and started doing really well in school. Like I buckled down. I was, I was all right. If I show up to show up to class, like that's half the battle (laughs) and uh, you know, did, did pretty, pretty good and such. And then I was 20 um, and my dad passed away. And so he had a massive stroke and it just, at that time in my life, I was right at that time where growing up where my dad and I, had, you know, kind of butted heads and, and he was, he was, you know, he wanted the best for me and he could see where, you know, what direction I was going in and just wanted to get me straightened out and on the path. And I was right at that age where, you know, where we go, Oh, wow. The stuff our parents are telling us is right. Like, you know, right. Yeah. 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 And it was literally maybe a six month period where my dad and I got really tight where I, I started, um, you know, recognizing a lot of that and then he passed away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, my whole life, um, you know, I've had one, one tool in the toolbox to handle, um, anxiety, depression, all that stuff. And that was alcohol. And so, you know, I, I ended up, I tried to go back to school. I was just drinking a lot more. Um, and I, I actually, I quit school for a while and then went, went back to, I <clears throat> went back to school a few, few years later. Um, kind of got my stuff together, realized my brain wasn't broken and, uh, then ended up, ended up going, I wanted to go to medical school. Um, ended up, I I was like, well, I'm not going back to university of Florida. So I got my AA and I'm like, well, I'm going to go to USF in Tampa because I don't, I haven't been there yet. (laughs) No. So went there and I got in the pre-med society, you know, try to, you know, doing, doing all those things. And I went back over vacation and I worked in the kennels in high school at the clinic that my mom was at. I went back and worked and got to work a little bit as an assistant, um, you know, kind of helping in surgery and doing that. And it was for a week on, it was, I think it was like thanks Thanksgiving break um, and I needed some money. So I went, went and worked and I was like, Oh no, like this is, this is what, I, and I always kind of vacillated between veterinary medicine and that. And I'm like, Nope, this is, this is it. This is what I want to do. So so that Thanksgiving holiday, yeah, that to cha- it, 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 change it, trajectory. It was, yeah. yeah it just because I was at that point where it's like, oh, things are lined up where, and it was like, oh wait, no, and we may get into a little bit of the, you know, the inner reasons why mm-hmm. I made that decision, but um, I just didn't feel I, I kind of felt like human medicine was a little too stuffy for my personality. Uh-huh. <laughs> like I didn't think, <laughs> you know, like I love. You know, I love, I love, I mean, I genuinely, like, I love science and I love surgery and I love medicine and I love all the, all the things about it. But I was like, I'm just not a suit and tie, you know, can I'm get, you know, and my yeah. top character strength is humor. And sometimes that can be misconstrued as not being serious about medicine. Yeah. Um, and so that I was like, yeah. and all the veterinary professionals I knew were all people I liked hanging out with. So I was like, this is great. definitely what right I yeah yeah well we always laugh and call human medicine the dark side right so you <laughs> want to go over to the dark side um a lot mm-hmm. of people come from there into vet med for sure and yeah. Especially yeah. Like sales reps like, oh man you guys are just grateful for like donuts and, and you know these human doctors right right we have to carry them out on trips like, in order to yeah get right 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 knowledge but i'm like no just yeah. feed us you know we don't get we don't uh, take no. to eat, so yeah we're, we're good we're food, good yep anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, there's, there's all these little um, life quirks. And I can remember when I was about um, 15, I, I was one of those, I always would be a veterinarian. And I went to yeah. work as a volunteer for my vet. And I think they probably tried to show me the most disgusting things they could, they could find to see if I was going to wh- pass out right, or right. the door. Right. Yeah. And they had this little poodle with this huge mammary mass about the size of a softball and yeah. they removed that thing. And I'm like, man, this is so cool. And they went, well, she didn't faint. Okay. So maybe she can handle it. Um, and, you know, I can't even tell you how many times I watch surgery drinking my morning coffee, just because I just, I'm like you, I just love the the medicine, the science of it. It's all fascinating to me. Uh, even though I didn't go to vet school, I still get jazzed about it a little yeah. bit just because oh, I yeah. love the, the knowledge of it. So um, you went to, where did you go to vet school? I went to Florida. To Florida. Okay. UF. UF. Yeah. UF. Lots of lots of good gators come out there. 
<laughs> yeah. Kind of funny story. I was just, I had cleaned out my office cause I got the new job and I was looking through some of the, like, you know, Fitzwood and uh, all the kind of all the stuff or for Twitter. And I was looking through and I sent Andy a picture. I had Andy's, I had met him, you know, in VBMA. Yeah. We went, we were in school, school together. Oh, and so I had his, his first name and his, his uh, UF uh, um, email written down. Oh, so I took God. a picture this morning. I was like, look at this. Like, That's this funny. Is. And for those of yeah. you who don't know, we're talking about Andy Rourke. You know, I met Andy yeah. at a VBMA meet and greet when I was doing some uh, training for Patterson. I was their communication yeah. and, and um, customer service trainer. And I met him. I, and I, was he was the was he the president of the VBMA? At that point in time, I want to say he not sure. He was two year. Uh, we were two years apart, yeah. so I was I was going. I was in practice by the time he was. By the in, time, okay, because you know, because um, yeah. Andy, Mary Gardner, and Danny McVaddy all were in the all same dra- class. Yep. You know, so yeah. I that's and and so I. Andy tells me one time he said I was he was like one of his first presentations at VBMA and he was talking about customer service and I was on the front row going mm-hmm. yeah 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 and he said Deb. You don't know how comforting that was to see you sitting in that front row going, yeah, yeah. you're right. You're right. And I went, whatever it takes. But now, of course, no, he doesn't need me to comfort him anymore on the stage. <laughs> he is fine out there. But yeah, it's funny um, how so many of us started that 2008, 2009, mm-hmm. in the middle of a recession and started these businesses yeah. that have since done very well. Yeah. So even even during tough times, good yeah. things can happen, right? So, so that's going to be 2008 is going to lead us into, I think what might be. Yeah. yeah. So how, how did, uh, how did life throw you that curveball? Yeah. So this, so I'm going to get, get a little bit more, get a little serious, you know, talking, going down this road and I am going to talk about suicide and suicidal ideation. So, you know, just want to give a warning just to warning. anybody yeah. that may be, may be listening. So 2008, so I'm a, I'm a relatively new grad again, that's good. And they graduated in 08. I graduated in 06. I am busting tail. Um, I'm working probably, you know, 70, 80 hours a week. And let me say this, the practice that I worked at did not do any of that to me. In fact, they, well, we'll get into how, how much they mean to me, but um, they, they did not try to, you know, put those on me. I, what I was, what I was doing is I had this thought that, you know, my, my, gift for graduation was that I got a job. And so I just tried to, you know, work as much as I could. So on my days off, I was, I was working at one, you know, the clinic that I grew up working at. So I'd go and work there on, on my days off working full time. And then I was trying to pick up emergency shifts, um, you know, when I could. So I was really didn't have a lot of time off. And I was warned, you know, I remember my, my first boss telling me, he's like, you need to, you need to slow down. And I was, and then he, he, our practice manager left. Um, so he took on a lot of the practice, um, management, uh, responsibilities and just started giving me all the surgeries. And we had, you know, most of the docs there. Um, I, I was really the main one that did surgery, but I was just out of school. Two years out. I, wow. I was like, give it. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, Oh, let's, you know, like I'll do it, do it all. Like I was a little, little cocky back. Like there. Superman. Yeah. Yeah. Which didn't, didn't work out well. So 80 hours a week. So job, job overload. I don't have, I don't have the tools that I have today. You know, I'm up in my head. I, I get defensive if questioned about things. Um, I'm potentially, I have a, at this point, I still have a pretty good level of emotional intelligence, but definitely misinterpret things where, you know, event happens. I fill in the blank with something that is not at all correct. Mm -hmm. I feel the resultant emotions from that. And I make critical decisions moving forward based on stuff that I've made up in my head. Mm -hmm. And we all, a lot of us do stories. We tell ourselves stories. We tell ourselves. Yeah. And, but it's, it, our brain can't tell the difference. Right. That's right. Our our brain doesn't know the truth from a lie. It only knows what we tell it. Right. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, you know, anxiety is building up, you know, all the stuff. And again, I got, I got one tool in the toolbox, alcohol and substance use. Mm. And I want to just say a side note on this, because this is something I'm really passionate about. There's a test that you can take that's called the adverse childhood experiences test. So it talks about childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. People that, and there's 10 questions, people that score four or more on that test are seven to 10, seven to 10 
times more likely to have an alcohol or substance use disorder Wow! because of the way that it affects our brains as our brains are forming, you know, 10 times the risk. Like if we, if there was anything in human, if there was anything in veterinary medicine that we knew it gave our patients a 10 times greater risk, we would do, we would, we would all be over it. Oh yeah. Have, on yeah. top of it. And so the story that I'll tell you is that that's, that's been my experience now on this side. Mm-hmm. is that almost every veterinary professional or person that I know going through it, when they take that test, they're four more, you know, and I happen to have six, six out of the 10. Yeah. Those things. Have you ever so, read so um, uh, Oprah Winfrey's new book? Uh, what um, happened to you? Yep. Amazing. Yeah. Fantastic. Also reframing the question instead of asking what's wrong with you, what happened what to you? What happened to you? Uh, Ga- yeah, and Gabor Mate um, and uh, Nissel Vanderbach, I think is his name, the two experts on trauma. Mm-hmm. Great, Amazing. Great stuff. But it Oprah, makes so much yeah. sense. So much yeah. sense, yeah. 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 So that's something as a side note, you know, yeah. I hope we are gonna be working on a lot more in that. Yeah. So bring it back, shoot back to 2008. So I'm drinking every night. Um, you know, I am really struggling and I'm still trying to show up to work. Um, you know, I'm coming in late, um, you know, showing a lot of the signs, you know, that everybody can, can see and they recognize what was going on with me, you know, with alcohol and substances. And so they, they ended up, thank God. And, and I also want to say I had a Ruger nine millimeter that sat, you know, I had it outside of my, um, sitting on my bed bed stand and I was like you know if a b or c happens when I get home from work I'm I just don't I was just apathetic I was out of hope you know Debbie we were talking about hope and solutions like yes. I, was out of, I didn't have any of it hopelessness I, just, I was like how hopelessness I'm like mm-hmm. how am I gonna how am I gonna do this for another 30 yeah. years yeah and I just started yeah yeah that, and that you know in, in Brene Brown's book you know of course this atlas of the heart mm-hmm. defines human emotion and hopelessness is defined as the, having no way out. Every day yeah, looks right, like it's right. going to be like today. And yeah. so there is no hope that there is a better right, tomorrow. Right. right. And so what I didn't know is there was a door number one and door number two. I thought it was either I'm going to keep drinking and using and all these things and I'm, I'm just not going to be here anymore. Um, or I'm going to get kicked out of practice, but I can't stop because I can't do, I can't do all these things. I didn't know that. The, I didn't really know there was a door number three. I didn't know there was another option. Thank God my, my colleagues and the, the owner and one of the other vets and the head technician, she played a huge part in this. So that's why we're all in this together. They saved my life. Um, so they, they got me into a program in Florida, most, most states have it for medical professionals that, um, you know, that have an alcohol or substance use disorder. So I go into treatment in 08. So I'm broke, you know, I'm scared. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of irrational fears. Like I'm going to lose my license. I'm never going to practice again. Like that instead of I'm looking at this as a moral, moral failure and a, and a professional failure and not what it is, which is, you know, trauma and, and all mm-hmm. the reasons why. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So about a month in, I'm sitting in this chair in the treatment center and I, I'm sitting in this chair. I just look up and what you just said, like, I was like, oh, like I had, I had some hope all of a sudden. And I was like, I, I think things might be okay. And it was a month, you know, it, was, it took me a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was like, maybe they're helping me with what I need. And I'm getting some, t- like, I'm starting to see that the way I had viewed the world was kind of skewed. And maybe I don't, maybe I don't know everything. Cause I used to think I was this, I always thought I was the smartest person in the room. And it's like, you know, maybe I'm, isn't it freeing to know I'm probably not. And let me hear what other people have to say. And maybe, maybe I've been looking at this through the wrong set of glasses. And so all of those tools came through and allowed me to love myself and love veterinary medicine again. So I was given a huge set of tools coming out um, through 12 step recovery and, and other things that genuinely helped me see veterinary medicine, not as, and didn't define myself as a veterinarian, but I really got to see how I could be of service. And a lot of that service didn't 
didn't necessarily have to do with my clinical acumen. Mm -hmm. It had to do how I treated that client, how I was there in that exam room with that client, you know, how all the stuff that we, you know, we, we uh, talk about and, and it know is so important. That's really what's, you know, what gives me that sense of service. So those things save my life. Um, you know, having a realistic optimism, not everything always is going to be okay, but given this event, this neutral, cause they're really neutral, good or bad, hard to say. Mm-hmm. Um, can I, can I move that needle towards a, that there's a good outcome that could be here? Because if I'm just spiraling downward with my negativity bias, like you said, I don't see hope. I don't see solutions. Mm-hmm. There's, I can't, yeah. I can't move forward. Yeah. So yeah. gratitude, flexible, flexible thinking, like saying, think, be curious, not judgmental. Yes. Um, huge. And then I've got, a, I've got another one on my desk that says, don't believe everything you think. Um, <laughs> That's, I love that one. I'm stealing uh, that one from you. That's definitely, yeah. Yeah. So, and then the last thing that I would say too, is that the mentality that got me into vet school, that competitiveness, like, you know, do perfection, do this, do that, 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 what got me, there was, there's a book, I forget who wrote it, but I love the title. It's what got you here. Won't get you. Won't get you there. Yeah. 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 And so realizing that I had, I was at this point in my life where in most, most of us really walk through this where we just, we change our focus. Mm-hmm. And so that was those things, you know, being open to support, being open to listen, you know, flexible thinking, and then, you know, just looking at the connectedness of everybody and gratitude. And, and what I would say too, that's, is very powerful for me. In fact, I was just talking to Tom, the CEO of Bet United. We were going back and forth last night, just talking and, you know, gratitude really helped save my life. Um, gratitude. When I sit down and do a gratitude list, like I can be in the middle of the world can be going crazy around me and I can go into my office and I would have in my old office, I had a gratitude journal and I would just pull it out. I looked at, and I would just start writing things that I was grateful for. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was usually about anywhere from like eight to 15 things that I wrote down. I felt fundamentally different than I did when I walked in there and nothing changed, like the stuff was still there, mm-hmm. but I changed. And I realized that it just, it just refocused me mm-hmm. and it changed my perception of the world around me faster than a, a shot of vodka. Would do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. That was what was powerful for me. Yeah. I love that. The power of power of gratitude. Gratitude. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, um, of talk about that and, and it is about taking a breath. Because so many, so many times people are just running, running, running through their day. And then, like you said, you, you were doing 80 hour work weeks. I'm sure you were, you know, you were thinking caseloads all the time and you know, what was going to happen next. And you, probably the only way you thought you could wind down was to drink that you just yeah. couldn't turn it off otherwise. But when we learn to just take a few moments and say, okay, look around me right now. You know, what are the things that are going right? How grateful I am for all these talented people that work with me. How grateful I am for the connections that I have in life. Even for me, I mean, I live at the beach. I walk outside and go, man, look at what I get to look at every single day. This is just the best. And I don't live on the ocean. I live on the salt marsh. So just spending Mm -hmm. a little time outside watching great blue herons come in and eat crabs and, uh, you know, poor crab, but anyway, it's just, I'm grateful for, for walking out, you know, just being able to walk outside and do those kind of things. And, and it doesn't have to be, I think people think that gratitude has to be, Oh my God, you know, somebody gave me a million dollars. This, this I'm very grateful. It's grateful for minute things like random acts mm-hmm. of kindness, the things that, clients do for us. The, I mean, I used to tell my staff, the first thing that will happen to you is you will gain 10 pounds because our clients feed us all the time. <laughs> and, and you know, that comes from having a really great team that's focused on client service, but it, it, you, you have to be grateful for those things mm-hmm. and look at all the good stuff. But our mind tends to migrate to negativity because our limbic brain is designed to save us from getting eaten by tigers. Right. So yeah. We default to fear, uh, first thing. And um, if we, we've got to learn that self-talk, we've got to learn to say, you know what, you're a line witch. 
not listening to you anymore. <laughs> this is not the truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. What is the truth. Right. Yeah. What is the truth? So obviously, you know, this is this has got to be a terrifying event for you. Um, and and getting into the 12 step program, but you, mm. you talk about getting some tools, specific yeah. tools that helped you overcome these kind of irrationalities. Yeah. So in this process, so when, when you're in a, a 12 step group, um, you, you go through, you go through an inventory. So you take almost your whole life and you look at resentments that you had against people, like where you thought, you know, people had wronged you or what. And I, I realized I had really played the victim, you know, a lot in, in my life. And, uh, you know, everything else is that it's everybody else's fault. Not, not that everybody feels it, but that was, that was part of where I was coming from. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, basically you go, go through your whole life. And then I see where there's a, a line in the book that says, uh, you know, we getting as getting as far as most people were wrong, uh, or as you know, most people were were wrong, had wronged us was as far as most of us had ever gotten, you know, and we failed to see that we had stepped on the toes of our fellows, and they had retaliated, you know, and I realized that these events or whatever it was, is that the common denominator was is that I was in it. You know, like I would, I was, oh, it was, it was surprising. All these things happened. And yet I was there like shocker. <laughs> and so it made me say, try to step back from up here and go, what one, what, what action did I do that, you know, helped facilitate that, that environment. And two, then what, you know, why did I feel like I had to feel that way? And so that ends up being very much like cognitive behavioral coaching and, and CBT and some other, but you know, this was, this stuff was done back in like 1939 or something like that. Yeah. So it's just, it was, it's, it was very impactful for me. And I've, you know, I'm, I'm a, a sponge uh, and just a, a seeker for, for a lot of this stuff, but, but that was, that was probably the biggest eye-opening moment for me and the you know gratitude and connectedness and realize that in this moment I'm fed you know I'm, I'm say you know, I have a roof over my head and it's and what am I doing I'm challenging that stress response because I've gotta I can't outthink once once the adrenaline hits once the epinephrine's in my system I can't outthink that I've got to let that you know do some things to let that wash out because it like you had mentioned it shuts off completely shuts parts. off my axe <laughs> Yeah, I can't, I can't get to it. I can't get to it. Mm -mm. And so that too is, you know, was, is realizing that we respond to, and, you know, in a veterinary practice, we respond to situations literally hundreds of times a day that trigger that, you know, Mrs. Jones is on the phone. Oh, she's ticked off. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> you know, you know. And I, yeah. Yeah. And it, and so they would, you know, I would I, now like I reflexively, I'm like, like just to, yeah. you know, kind of ground myself before I say something, because yeah. it's still in me, Debbie, like uh, oh, that's yeah. the, and that's part of the, you know, we'll talk about like what, you know, what I feel like, you know, one of my biggest career mistakes was, yeah. um, well, but that, you know, that, you know that, even that going thing. through that, it's still learning. Yeah. That, that same thing happens to family, right? So, you know, I've yeah. been married next, the September the 9th, I have been married 44 years. Ah. So being able to take a breath. <laughs> And stop yeah. the mm, response is one right. of the reasons that we've been married so long. Hundred Be percent. Because you've yeah. got to you've got to say this was not intentional. Like yeah. I, I, when I'm teaching a class, I talk about this and I talk about the things that aggravate you, right? So the things that used to aggravate me were when we didn't have an ice maker. My husband would put empty ice trays back in the freezer, and this would drive me yeah. crazy. Yeah. Or he would leave a milk carton in that had this much milk left. It's yeah insane um and and so you assume that there's negative intent that people are doing right. just to aggravate you well, right then that yep yeah but they're not so when going back to being curious and not furious it has mm -hmm. to be well why did this thing happen well you know I, I i just solved the problem by getting an ice maker for one thing and the other but the milk thing is still <laughs> you know just refused to move it you know and then it's his yeah. problem <laughs> so but it's not there's not malintent behind it it was just right. he is a driver personality who gets things done checks it off the list and moves on to the next thing so something 
got his attention that he needed to right. move on to the next thing, yeah. he'd come back to it because he's a neat freak. 100%. So so it's understanding that kind of stuff, but stopping yourself from saying anything in the moment is mm -hmm. where there's a strategic plan and emotional intelligence kicks in that says, okay, mm -hmm. my brain is overreacting. They did not mean any harm. Always assume positive intent. Same thing with clients. You know, it, we talk about clients not telling us the truth, right? And uh, mm -hmm. it's so frustrating for technicians to get a story and then the vet come in and the story completely changes. But sometimes it's just that client had time between to, the first encounter yeah, and the second right. to remember stuff. So it's not negative. It's just mental cognition. Right. Cut them a break, right? Cut them a break. It's not yeah. about you. Right. It's really yeah. not. <laughs> and that's just it. And what's the fact? The fact is the story changed. Yeah. But it's, but if we, if we, when we tie the negative motive to it, yes, we're going to, like right. you said, but there's some kind of deception it. involved. Yeah. They're not being deceptive. Yeah. And then of course, and then of course I'm going to get my hackles up. And right. If that were true, if it were but it's not. <laughs> it's not true. It's right. not it's, true. But it's not oh, true. Oh man. Right. Um, so so yeah. let's talk a little bit about um, a decision-making process. So you, mm -hmm. you, your team actually comes to you, the people that are you are surrounded by. Mm -hmm. So I'm so excited to hear that because that means that in all teams, this is possible mm -hmm. that we can yeah. help each other if we are paying attention and if we have developed enough trust with each other to be able to move into a very yeah. difficult conversation. Right. Um, so once this was happening and they were, you know, I don't know if they had an intervention. I don't know how this worked, but how did you move through that? You know, how did you kind of go, oh, you know what? They're right. I need to do something. Yeah. Well, it was, so they were able to get, get this third, third, um, um, counsel or, or uh, um, program involved so it wasn't they didn't necessarily sit down with me but it wasn't until at but but going into the thought process I I think that I'm you know because then I'm defensive because I'm work because it's fear like you said now I'm fearful I'm scared I'm broke I'm full of sh shame and guilt and that in me comes out as anger and so I think that, you know, I start telling myself that my boss did this, you know, like telling these crazy stories in my head versus the complete opposite was the case is that they, they cared about, you know, they, they saved my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's, you know, we talk about veterinary medicines that like, I'm a lot, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't here. I didn't make that decision because of veterinary. Medicine. I'm still, I'm still alive because of veterinarians. Mm -hmm. I mean, my wife's a veterinarian. She helped save my life going through this too. And by the way, she was probably about two weeks away from walking away from me before I went into treatment because of all the, you know, the extra, you know, the thought process and the mm -hmm. things and the stuff. And she, we went on that journey together and she, she really, um, she, she grew too. And it's like our relationship today is, I mean, it, it's amazing. Like, and that's that same thing. Cause we both try to do those, those things, but anyhow, just, yeah. I can't say enough about, about the pausing and the learning the, the cognitive, um, you know, changes. And yeah. 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 But, um, but that was what I would say to, to fast forward is the team that the practice that I was just at for 12 years, the team that I just left, we had a degree of psychological, you know, we hear that term psychological safety. Mm -hmm. What does that, you know, what does that mean? Where if you make a mistake, it's not held against you. You know, if you make a mistake, my first thought as a leader is where did we go wrong in this? Like what's wrong in the system? Because yes. I trust all of these. I trust everybody here mm -hmm. implicitly. Everybody's here is incredibly competent. If there's a mistake, one, we're human. So if we're, if we're saying zero, zero error rate is what that's impossible. Like that's ridiculous, but that's how medicine runs sometimes, which is crazy because pilots don't do that. Thank God, <laughs> you know, they anticipate that there's going to be a mistake and then they have a checklist to go, mm -hmm. but that, that level of trust that's there is what, what gets us there. So vulnerability is, 
what you know you talked talked about Brene Brown that's yeah. one of those is as as leaders like are we are we saying we never make mistakes and you know and get angry and that like that will not that is the ant the yeah. opposite of psychological safety yeah um you know is that and then are we are we civil you know are we are we able to have healthy discourse you know between us and one of the biggest things that's so a it's a little little Ted Lassoy like like uh, you know the Walt Whitman quote is can we be honest with empathy mm -hmm. you know can we can we give feedback that we have understood how that may land with that person and support them and understand how they might feel initially support them through that and then walk them through and say you know this is we're not being judgmental but it's that is something that is that is a skill and takes time mm -hmm. um and that's also a very much a trauma response too like when mm -hmm. we talked about you know aces and a lot of veterinary professionals it'd be interesting i'm hoping we're going to have more more studies on the numbers you know but it's probably probably around 20 percent of veterinary professionals have four or more aces i would i would assume that's not a hard fact just based on human medicine and mm -hmm. but yeah that's the if we give feedback and somebody is immediately defend oh, i didn't do you know i did that's that's tr that's that's learn long learned it's, response it's a long learned yeah. trauma response and, you're right yeah you're right. and i used to i used to respond like that to yeah. feedback yeah and then i realized you know that that was how when we would have some staff members that would do that we'd have some open and honest conversations about it and it changed how we were able to give feedback and then we were able to be honest with empathy because i knew what they had been through and I knew how that meant land and our staff understood that. And that, that to me is beautiful. I mean, it's just magical mm -hmm. when yeah. you have a team, when you really have that. Yeah. Together. You know, and that, it occurred to me too, that this is something else that we, we <laughs> could do with clients because when we are, yep. we have to know when to pull back. So if you're giving somebody feedback and they're immediately defensive, then it's not time to keep moving forward. It's time to ride along with it for a little bit and start mm -hmm. to ask some more questions because in, in, until they yeah. get to that point of psychological safety and that goes for our team members and for our clients, yeah. we can't logically have a conversation. It's um, yeah. very We're much like uh, that that yeah. dog that is standing and snarling in the corner. You're not going to go pet that dog. you got to wait until he throws some treats right. out and gets down to a, Right. A, a psychological right. level that says, okay, maybe you're not so bad. Um, and the yeah. same thing for humans, but we, we tend to want to push forward because we want to win rather than negotiate and listen yeah. to the other side of the story. But you mentioned um, your, your biggest career mistakes. Now I'm curious, yeah. is, other than working all those jobs, what, what do you get? <laughs> your biggest yeah. Mistakes? Which that was, yeah, right. Which is still, I still, str I still struggle with that. Um, so I, I came on board to the place that I'm at now. Um, I came on board and, um, was, was kind of with the, we needed, needed a vet to anchor, kind of anchor the clinic and help move forward and such. And so I took that like, okay, we're going to do things my way and we're going to move from, you know, command and control. And this is how things are going to be. And this is, da, 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 da. and that doesn't work. Like command and control does not work. And so we talk about psychological safety. We didn't have it. And it was like, I was a significant part of that. You know, it was me. And thank God, I mean, because I'm in, you know, it was like, it was tough for me because I, I was like, I realized I'm like, I'm still acting like I know, like, I know all this stuff, you know, I, and, and yet I'm not, I'm not able to put it into practice. So I started getting more curious, like, why is it that I genuinely, and I would, I would say to, you know, my, my mentors, and stuff, I'm like, I don't know why I can't do this. And it was, I was too stressed. Like when I looked at everything I was trying to take on, I was in that threat mode, can't access that, that thinking empathetic part of my brain. And I was in threat mode, like almost the whole time. Well, that when I'm in there, that's when the crappy stuff comes out, you know? And so 
the the key for me and unfortunately i didn't learn this until later but i did learn it about two two three years later we ended up having a new practice manager and her and i were very um we gelled very well as far as the vision for the practice and we i mean we helped create a kick-ass practice and what i realized is one is that leaders as leaders like we have to we have to know that our behavior has an outsized influence on our team members and it's like yes we're all human but like we have to we have to practice what we preach so i really tried to not do things scheduling wise breaks wise like i i made it where i would i would go to the gym like lunch was sacrosanct for our staff Mm -hmm. but it wasn't for me Uh, i was a martyr yeah like we were talking about Mm -hmm. is it's fine for i want everybody to have lunch i want you all to you earned it like you need it you deserve it this is where we're gonna when we stop seeing appointments at 11 30 to make sure they weren't running into lunch and cutting their lunch we did all those things but i wasn't taking lunch you didn't and model the behavior time to, yeah yeah and when i started doing that debbie <laughs> when i started practicing what i preached it was amazing like it was like i got bad i was refreshed and i was like you know we were joking around and i could diffuse what you know, whatever happened in the morning and damn it, if we weren't like, we were more productive, like all the ROI, st- like all that stuff went, you know, the, the KPIs were great. Like we doubled the gross of the practice in a, in a few years and it was just, and we were happy as hell. Like, and it was like, wow, this is, this is great. So, you know, it's like, I wish, I mean, I, re- I regret having to walk through that. Cause I'd been, I'd worked for you know, I'd seen some of those things before mm-hmm. and I just never wanted to be like, and I, I was like, man, even knowing all this stuff, I'm still like this. Yeah. So what do I need to do? What do I need to change in myself to make that happen? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, that point is, is extremely valid because if you have been the uh, subject of a, of a manager or boss who is commanded control, and that's the model mm-hmm. that you see to run a business, then that's what you assume, even though mentally you realize that this is not working. It doesn't work for human right. behavior, but that's the only way you know. And I see that happening yeah. a lot with managers mm-hmm. who come into this position. Maybe they were the lead tech or the lead CSR, and they were really good at that. But then they model the behavior of someone who is, not a great manager, but that's how they were kind of raised into it. And that's all they know. Oh, so yeah. yeah, you, you only model what you see, right? You, well, if I'm a manager, basically I have to be a jerk. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have to rule from the top down yeah. and, you know, and I have to fuss at people all the time rather than try, trying, trying right. to grow them and help them. Yeah. Yeah. And so what's, what I was going to say is what I, what I always tell the tell our team members, I say, I will never knowingly, I will do everything in my power. I never want you to be in a position of responsibility and not have been given the tools to do it. Like Mm -hmm. that is the most stressful thing. You know, for instance, being a, being a new grad veterinarian and saying, I need you to do four spays, you know, this morning. Uh, And I've done one spay, you know, in vet school. Mm -hmm. No, like, well, I need to, I need to send that, but you know, they need to be able to get the experience so that I'm putting them in a position to be successful, Yeah. you know, and whatever that means. And we do that with, and then we, then we do it with our leaders. Mm -hmm. We put somebody in a position of leadership and performance as we, you know, high performance in one task or in one job, job description does not equate to leadership, you know? And so we need to learn how to be leaders. Right. And so that's, and I, I think we're doing a hell of a lot better job oh, yeah. um, now, like seeing that, like, it's just really good, but it's that same thing is like, we wouldn't, we wouldn't put a technician, you know, monitoring anesthesia. Who's never, who has, doesn't have any experience that we never do that. Mm-hmm. Why would we put, why would we put someone in a position in a management position and not give them yeah. leadership skills? Exactly. Or all the tools that they need to do it. You know, all we, the tool, or all the tools, right. Yeah. yeah right. Here you do this, yeah. but we're not going to tell you you know, certain things right, right, you know, that you right. need to know about how to do your job. Yeah. We're not yeah. going to tell you that stuff. Yeah. So you're hamstrung so. in your work, but yeah. So um, let's talk about um, network 
because okay. for me, well, you and I met oddly enough in a bar. <laughs> which I yeah. <laughs> but that was, that's just networking stuff. So we were, um, yeah. At uh, at VMAX, but we had you know read each yeah. other's stuff, and um, oh yeah, certainly a fan of yours for a long time. But um, you know, networking has meant a lot to me in my career, oh, yeah. and certainly gotten me connected with some really amazing people. So tell me, you know, how you feel networking has helped you get where you are. Well, I just love. I mean, one, I just love veterinary professionals. Like, I love getting to know. Like what, exactly what you're doing. Like, I wish I could do this with everybody, you know, is yeah. what brought you here? Like what's, been, you know, what's the story? What's behind, you know, what, what's your driver? What's your values? Like, I love, I genuinely love hearing that, you know, from people. Um, so one, I'm just, and as it may come as a surprise, but I, I'm a maxed out extrovert. <laughs> so <laughs> like I am very, uh, very energized by, you know, by other people. Um, but I do, it's, Anyway, it's interesting too. I do love sitting and reading and being in that, but I love being, I love the energy with people like those, con like conferences. Oh, woo. oh like, yeah. I'm, I'm like jazz. Love, love yeah. getting to meet it. Yeah. Getting to see yeah. everybody. In fact, we're going to, I just got an email that we're all going to have dinner in uh, September in Nashville, I think. Oh yeah. I saw that. Yeah. I saw yeah. It Josh. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, but um, the, I will say the two, the two things that, were really surprising to me, especially in the, in the well-being arena, if you will. I didn't realize getting involved in this area, how much I was going to love the people. I, I don't know why it just what, not that it wasn't on my, but I just didn't realize like how vitally important that was going to be to my soul and just moving forward and being able to, you know, that I think of, I think of that movie with uh, Russell Crowe. What was it when he was uh, he was writing the A Beautiful Mind? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, his theory was that we, you know, instead of being the uh, um, oh, I should should know the guy's name, but the uh, the Invisible Hand, um, you know, economics thing that pushes the that instead when we're all working together, you know, instead of fighting against one another, when we're all working together for the same goal, it's exponentially better. Like that to me is that's that's what i love about what we were talking with hope and veterinary medicine and, yeah. and all of this so that i i mean and just getting to getting to be able to say oh i met this person oh they're doing i think they're doing that and then you know sending sending an email and you know email introductions and i love connecting people and doing yeah. that yeah. and then the other thing is what's interesting so i would say linkedin like i didn't realize how much i would really enjoy linkedin i mean it's so much positivity and it's great people mm -hmm. i sent an email or i sent a message to there's a guy named cal buyer and cal does suicide prevention and well-being in construction professionals Ooh. and he's nationally known in in that arena and he's done, he's done a ton of stuff he's just the nicest nicest man just is a great great guy and he posted something and I said, Hey, I'm kind of doing, you know, similar things in veterinary medicine. And I talked to some other people in law enforcement and other professions and really seeing how, how there's so much overlap, you know, when we talk about it, that we're not really as different as we think. And I sent him that message and we had a talk like, the, like he scheduled 10 minutes and we talked for an hour and a half. And, um, it was like, I can, I, like, I love the guy and he, knew everybody and he got me connected with. So now I'm like, because of that, that one connection probably led to, I'm on the National Workplace Suicide Prevention and post venture Committee. That led to me doing a presentation there that two people from the CDC were on. They said, so I get to, you know, work yeah. for, you know, as, as one of the representatives for veterinary medicine for a workplace yeah. um, well-being council for, for the CDC. And I mean, it's just, amazing and i just love i mean i just i love i love doing cool stuff with cool people right like yeah you know i just i just love it i mean i just like any collaboration and it's like half the time it's like I, i'm just any opportunity to do these kind of things i just yeah. get jazzed up about. Yeah. so i guess that i don't know that i i, well, I went in 20 different directions oh no it's all you know it's all good know. because it's it's true the the good that you can do when you find your team of collaborators yeah. and, and and you're thinking about moving the needle in veterinary medicine, then we've mm -hmm. got to find 
people who are telling the right story, who are, mm -hmm. who understand deeply what the problem is, but also can see the tunnel out, right? Rather than tunneling down into the rabbit hole, you right. see the, the way to dig ourselves out of this tunnel. And that's why, I, you know, I was really excited to connect with you um, that night at VMAX. So I'm like, this is like yeah. somebody who gets it, who sees the same things I see and who wants to help the way I want to help. So like, yay, this is, this is a person that I need to know. And, and, you know, Josh Faceman is the same way. So Josh oh, is yeah. another, you know, positive psychology guru and I can't wait. Mm -hmm. His book is coming out. And I yep. was one of the people who, um, you know, previewed and did a little yep. editing on the book. And I was yeah, like, yeah. man, this is so good. It's got to come yeah. out soon. We need it so desperately because it's just, you know, once you know this stuff, you, you will always know it. You can't unknow it. Yeah. And we so need to know it. And I, over the years, you know, I've been teaching similar things, communication tools for 15 years in vet med. Mm -hmm. And honestly, the people who would come to my classes would be the CSRs, you know, the occasional manager, but hardly ever the veterinarians. Yeah. You know, and these were the leaders in the hospital by default, even if right. they were associates, they're still leaders. And then the practice right. owners would send people, right? But I'm like, no, right. like you said, from the leadership right. down. And, and until the leaders learn this stuff, the snowball continues to roll downhill and right. And the people are going to get, keep getting crushed under it. So we've got to yeah. stop the snowball and the snowball start oh with the owners, leaders, and managers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does. That's yeah. The, I mean, that's, both. that's the, I mean, that's genuinely the, the great news. Like mm -hmm. that's the hope is that seeing what an impact that has mm -hmm. it's just it. And then it, and then it's just exponential. And then all the work that, all the things that everybody, you know, anybody else that's in veterinary medicine is just hungry for, it allows that to, to blossom. It allows that to, to grow because uh -huh. we have so many people that are so, you know, to want this and are grow, but then it, you know, you can't, you can't go anywhere with it. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. There, yeah. You know, there's in certain, a certain environments. Yeah. Exactly. And then that, that's hard. You well, know, it's hard to put put your heart into it. I know you and I yeah. both worked on the veterinary visionaries and that was mm -hmm. how we can help, you know, create well-being in our profession. And my suggestion um, was that we do teach communication and, and this kind of psychological safety, but the mm -hmm. only way we will get it done is to make it mandatory and put it into the CE requirements of veterinarians by yeah. the state boards. And because otherwise they will continue to go and hide out in oncology lectures right. and not learn this stuff because this stuff is uncomfortable and medicine for, for veterinarians is extremely comfortable. So again, it's and taking it's like, us out of our comfort zones. I know. And it's almost the, and I'm, so I am not discounting the, the, the wonderment and the amazing, amazing things that happen in medicine and surgery, but it's almost the easy part. <laughs> like, is that me understanding, you know, what tests to run for Cushing's and the meds and dosing and, you know, do I run an ACTH stem? Do I run a low-dose dex? Do I do, you know, all these types of things. Like it's how can I, that patient is connected to an owner. And then how do I, how, how can I, how can I improve my well being with a dog that has Cushing's? Mm -hmm. If I, if I'm connected to that, like if I'm able to, communicate to that owner and give that owner a great experience like that that adds to you know mm -hmm. not only does the experience do it but if we're doing that well we're not we're also what's there's a saying uh like don't don't uh don't bang your shin on a stool that shouldn't be there in the first place yeah. you know is like you know is do, if we're doing that, we're, we're not, we're also not creating the problems that happen with poor communication yeah. and misinterpretation oh, yeah. and all that, yeah. which then adds what that takes away from our, you know, our well being. So yeah. taking things away are is just as important as doing the positive things, mm -hmm. you know, is taking away the things that can potentially bring us down. And so communication is a huge, did, did you read uh, Alan Alda's new book? I haven't seen it. No. Hold on. Um, I, have it? Oh, I just bumped a bunch of stuff. It's uh, what I have 
if I, if I understood you, would I have this look or if I, would I have this look on my face if I understood what you were saying oh, yeah. and it's his book on community. It just came out. It's fantastic. And he, I have the audio book. I think you'll love it, oh, yeah. but it's all these same things, you know, and he, the first, the first uh, story that he tells is a dentist who did a procedure on him and didn't explain the procedure. It affected how he smiled and he's an actor for God's oh. sake, you know, and he said when he took it to the dentist, the dentist was immediately went into defense mode and you should have known this. And you should, instead of, it was a genuine question. And instead of being empathetic, this guy went into full defense mode, like he was going to get sued. And that's the other thing is like, can we, cause I still get, I mean, I still get fearful. Like if, if I think something's misinterpreted and I have to do, like you said, when I sit down with a client, I just, I have to sit in my chair and I just say, please let me be of service to this patient and this client and try to let the, cause I, the, I can't stop the fear response and mm -hmm. the threat response, but I, but I can recognize that I'm in it. Mm -hmm. And then I know if I pick, if I pick up that phone, Debbie, and it's like, you know, we say, you know, smile, they can hear, hear the smile yeah. through the phone. They can, they're going to hear me picking up that phone with, with, um, the, with the threat response, because mm -hmm. I'm going to be defensive. Oh, I'm yeah. going to be, and I have to reset and go, okay, would I have done anything different in this case? No, I did, you know, and then go mm -hmm. through the checklist and just, just be of service, mm -hmm. like be, be a communicator, be a supporter. Mm -hmm. of I this love patient. that. Can I be of service? Oh, and then, pick, yeah. yeah. And, and I have to do that still because yeah. I have to reset that, that reflexive response. You know, I yeah. would I was having a conversation with Jules Benson, who's the chief medical officer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, Jules. Yeah. And we were talking about board complaints. And he said, yeah. most, and I, I said, you know, board complaints are not because of malpractice 90% of the time. Yeah. They're because of poor communication 90% right. of the time. Yeah. And, and, and that is what we realize, you know, and sometimes I think yeah. when we think, oh, I'm too busy to spend time with this chatty client who wants me to answer 500 questions, you know, over and over and over again, mm. do you have time to defend your license against a board complaint if you don't do it? Yeah. And, and right. so sometimes our idea of the time, oh, this is a, a waste of my time, not really a waste of your time. It can be on yeah. the other end of it, not to mention the anxiety and stress and, you know, pain and suffering that everybody goes through when that, that kind of stuff happens. And, a lot of the stuff I see on social media where clients are just, you know, attacking practices so many times is like, oh, if you had just done this, you know, if you just use this communication tool, if you had just yeah. known this skill, then you would not be in this situation and neither yeah. would the client and none of this stuff would have happened. And so we we have to understand that communication is the root of everything and being able to manage yeah. conflict is one of the greatest skill sets we can ever have and, and manage yeah. it in a way that we are not defensive, but rather going back to that curiosity again and again and again and again mm -hmm. until people feel truly listened to. Because when yeah. you, they attack when they don't feel like you care or you're listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a discussion we have with ourselves in our head, but we need to prep for it and, and understand yeah. it that it's coming. And yeah. that too, that client, client that answers the questions, what, you know, all, all we can say is that clients called three times mm -hmm. you know, versus saying like, what am I, am I saying in my head, doesn't she know how busy I am? I'm, I've no, got, you know, I've got a hit by car that came in and it's like, yeah, no, she doesn't, doesn't she know, doesn't nobody know. Told worried it. about, but it's, but we don't, if we don't take that moment and this is any, any of us, like that's, that's where the. You know, I'm with you 100. Like we're oh yeah, I'm yeah. With you 100%. Well, you know, we we yeah. talked about all the stuff that happened at curbside, and clients got so upset because they mm -hmm. were like out in the parking lot, and that. And we, but did you tell them? Because they didn't know that you were slammed. They didn't know you were shorthanded. They right. didn't know that you were doing curbside, and they just yeah. called, and and it's a month, and and that's never been that way. So why didn't you right. get this information <laughs> out? Right. Tell right. people this stuff. I actually right. wrote a letter that I gave away and I said, just, yeah. just do this, just send this out to your clients and yeah. let them know the circumstances. 
And when they did, the people who used it said, oh, my God, but this was like Christmas. People brought us gifts. One of my clients oh. actually had clients, her clients say, can we come and help you answer the phone? I mean, this was the response they got when they said, we're just covered up and, and we mm -hmm. are doing the best we can. Please give us grace. And, and yeah. we expect people to know what it's like. Right. And why should they? Because we don't know what their yeah. job is like, you know? Right. Yeah. And it's the same. I mean, it's the same, we were talking about married 44 years yeah. or our relate. Yeah. You know, I call, I call my wife, like I need to, I'm in the middle, like everything's going crazy right now. Don't you know how much I need to talk to you? And it's like, no, she doesn't know. No, like, she doesn't know. How could she, how could she possibly yeah. know, uh, the, you know, what all this other stuff that's, that's going on. But then I pull that into it and then say, you should have known. You should have and known. Now I'm, and now I'm resentful and now I'm angry with you. And then because I'm angry with you, you're going to, yeah. And emotional contagion, mirror neurons. I'm going to, I'm going to reflect that back to you. And yeah. then we spiral down because guess what? I had a wrong thought. Shocker. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will, um, I will use um, exaggeration. And this is, yeah. a, well, I don't think we use very much, but because, because we're afraid of using it, but like for my husband, he'll, he'll get mad about something. And I went, yes, I intentionally did that. I wanted, I knew you would be mad. I knew you would just go <laughs> off the rails and I'm so happy that it worked. And he just go, oh, <laughs> uh, right. But, but, but if you look at it like that, I mean, we could do that to the client, mm -hmm. it, depending on, you know, where the, I mean, it's, and this is all just, there's such finesse to it that mm -hmm. if you have to be able to yeah. read the room and that's where we miss some of the social cues and yeah. say yes you know this is exactly what i wanted i wanted to charge you yeah. thousands of dollars because <laughs> i wanted right. your dog to be sick and you know this is this is my goal in life is to make sure that animals stay sick so we can make a yeah. lot of money uh and, and it, the the, the oh, ridiculousness ahead, sorry, is shined on that mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i was thinking you know the the one of the best so i i I always think I have original thoughts and very rarely do it. Like somebody smarter than me or before me had the same thought. At least I'm on the same page. Exactly. But one thing that I, I do say to clients is like, if I have, you know, if I come back and all of a sudden, you know, they, they come in and, you know, dogs end stage renal failure or pancreatitis or something like that, you know, I'll, I'll come in or it's, you know, significant financial, you know, foreign body or anything is to set the stage for the client and let them know, as I said, I know you didn't wake up this morning expecting this. Mm -hmm. And it's just, and it's that connection where I'm saying, you know, I understand like, mm -hmm. you know, as a parent, as a father, as a human being of this earth, like, I know you've got a lot going on. And like, I know this wasn't on, on your list of things. And I've just given you something heavy. Mm -hmm. Let's work, like, let's figure out a, you know what the best way forward yeah. is. Let's and let's work it together. Yeah. Let's yeah. And just something to honor, you know, to to let that client know that, you know, you you can yeah. empathize with their there's their there's system. empathy. And whatever that may whatever that right, whatever that's but that is the yeah. There's the, a the a, a manager, um a great manager up in upstate New York, Carrie Bogren. And Carrie says when they started telling people, we understand that vet med is expensive. And so we have built solutions mm -hmm. for you if you need them. And she said, not even, they didn't even have to ask the clients, you yeah. know, didn't ask about it. We, they just said, we built solutions for you. And she said, 99% of the time people go, well, that's so nice. I don't, I'm okay though. I don't need it. But for the ones who do need it, it's great. But, but it's taken completely away that you're only in it for the money thing money. because right. you have set again, another system in place that says, we understand that this is a challenge to our clients and this is a problem that we work to solve with you, you know, instead yeah. of going too bad, you got to figure it out on your own, right. you know? Right. And um, so I think we, we, we need to look at so many times that the people in our lives as collaborators rather than our enemies. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then right. how do we collaborate together? How do we get on the yeah. same page? Cause we both want the same thing. We all want the same thing in vet med. And that is that animal yeah. to walk out our door healthy. The owners want it and we want it. So yep. it's it's a team effort and it's not yep. an adversarial <clears throat> effort. And I really feel like, right. especially with some of the social media groups slamming clients, yeah, that it's... we're 
we are setting up an energy, yeah. like you said, that is, it is, you can feel it's that. Us versus, yeah, yeah us, us versus, versus them. them. And it's not us yeah. and, it's us yeah. versus. And that's, and that's, and it doesn't play well. Yeah. And that's a huge, so I'd say too, at the, you know, at our practice, of the practice I was saying, our practice I was at, is that that was very much is that the client we were at is that we were a team, you know, is that our, our job as medical professionals, I may go into room one and have the same, the, potentially the same condition going on. I'm going to go over the options with that owner and room one may pick something totally different than room three. And it's just because I, my job is to help that unit. And mm -hmm. that's how much I've, you know, when we start talking about spectrum of care, it gets, it gets a little, I don't know, you get into general practice and it's like, I, I want, I want what's, what's best overall. Mm -hmm. And it's like, is it, is it, is it the best thing for me to say that, you know, we need to do, you know, $2,500 worth of diagnostics. I don't know. You know, I offer it. I offer it because it's, you know, that is as a veterinarian, I need to be able to do that. I say, then we, you know, we potentially can do this and we can potentially do this mm -hmm. and very much that same thing. I, I know you didn't wake up this morning expecting this honoring that that's a financial reason. Like I just want to help you. And I feel like we're more of coaches, like almost like let's guide, guide you through it as best we can. Mm -hmm. And I, that gives me a significant amount of joy and and well-being and a profile mm -hmm. like to to know that i've been of service to that patient yeah. and that client yeah i just don't have a lot of people you know we we have these stories of oh this person comes in and they you know they hate their dog or they don't want to they don't want to spend any money and it's like i just don't I'm just looking for salute like why are they together they? like yeah if why they, did they come in right if they didn't care like, not right that's the best business. right the best yeah, yeah. And it just I those to, cases just don't go ahead. So yeah, I was gonna say I used to teach when I was teaching communication skills, find something to praise, you know, uh, for yeah. your client. And one girl raised her hand and she said, What if there's really nothing there to praise? And I said, Did they walk in your door? And she yeah. said, Yeah. And I said, 25% of people who own a pet never bring it to the vet. This is the Bracky study from back in 2008. Mm -hmm. So that shows me they're better pet owner than 25% of people yeah. appreciate it, that they're there. And right. she's like, wow, you're right. I said, start there, you know? So you set the tone saying, I'm so glad you brought him in. Good catch yeah. on your part. Yeah. How can we, how can we together work on this problem? Right. Yeah. This may be the most, I don't know, controversial or part, part of the, the talk that I'll say is that, you know, when it comes to spectrum of care in this, this, um, if not a concept, but when we talk about moral injury or being a, being a professional and not being in the position to deliver the kind of care that we're trained to do from external circumstances. So it's like, that's how, how strongly is, a, is the practicing of spectrum of care as a general practitioner attached to our level of moral injury? Mm -hmm. Because then if we, then if we believe that every patient should get the, should be cared for the same way they were when I was at university of Florida, like I could, my wife and I are both veterinarians. Like I couldn't, have, I don't know that I could afford to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and then I think, you know, bigger picture, like, does that mean that me growing up, I, we sure as hell couldn't have afforded to have dogs, mm -hmm. you know, when I was a kid. And then we start talking about like, how do we, how do we get veterinarians and how do we do this? Well, then if I couldn't have, why would I have wanted to be a veterinarian if I didn't have dogs growing up, even though we were mm -hmm. poor? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I don't know, it's just, it's a big, you know, it's an interesting picture, but it takes introspection yeah. where yeah. it's a good, you know, it's a good, it's curious, not judgmental. It's just, exactly. I'm not, I'm not throwing, I'm not, I'm not discounting anyone's, but I'm curious about it. Like what, where is the connection between and well being in the profession? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as a, as a general practitioner, yeah. um, you know, and spectrum of care and where, where does that sit? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and, and I'll say too, is that when it comes to that, like our practice, I'm not saying this is everybody needs to do that, but we were a privately owned practice to, to great veterinarians um, own the three practices I was at. We had a, at our practice, we, we just had a, I, I, when I, I said, I'm never going to let a block cat Dying, I'm never going to let a pile die. 
Mm-hmm. It's just not like mm-hmm. I said, if we eat it, like I don't, I said something that I know that if we do one, one specific thing that we can change the course of that pet's life, like we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's, and just doing that. And, you know, we, I mean, those things don't happen all that often. So right. like, yes, if you look at, if you're looking solely at KPIs and solely at numbers and all that, and we were talking about retention. Yeah. You know, if I was forced to have to euthanize all of those, pet, like a health, healthy pet that I had the capabilities of doing, would I stay there? Probably not. Or I would have opened my own shop or done so. But mm-hmm. because of how they were, like I stayed, I mean, I, I was, I'm his medical director, but I didn't own the. Yeah. Place. Yeah. And my I mean, I my advice for has for years been give your veterinarians discretionary so, funds or, or, yep. could, you know, create a foundation because sometimes people can't afford it or they can't afford all of it. They can afford some of it and, and yeah. you a little bit of cushion, you know, and, yeah. and so you, but you control it. You just don't randomly go, right. okay, fine, we'll just do all right. that. You just say, okay, we're controlling. Here's the funds that you have $5,000 yeah. a year Something. Right. to do charity <laughs> work, to help people, you know, yeah. and you, you set the parameters. But the other thing that just kind of drives me crazy is we always think it's all or nothing, but it yeah. can be this and, you know, the <laughs> and word works. Yeah. And and we can do this today. And when you get paid, we can do this and then and, we can do right. this. You know, and I had people who paid me like the mortgage and, and I've had managers push back to say, well, don't you have to escrow that? I would good grief. People help people quit detailing yeah. it to death, right. help people. And, yeah. and so this lady paid me, you know, a hundred dollars a month and she would come in with three dogs and we wipe it all out, you know, yeah. once or twice a year right. and we would do it again. And it was an yeah. agreement between the two of us and it worked out just fine. So yeah. we need to be a little creative in helping people yeah. and in divide and conquer. You do not have to do everything on one visit. I have this older yeah. veterinarian say, but Debbie, they don't want to come in, you know, once, much less come in two or three times. I went, that's because you make it such a shitty experience when they come. <laughs> no wonder they don't want to come back. You make them wait. You're not yeah. nice to them. You talk over right, them. Right. If you yeah. make it a great experience, they will come as many times as you ask to look after that animal. So yeah. that is your preconceived notion yeah. and your poor customer service. Yeah. And the thing is, is subjectively like our, and we, we would always, we didn't write it off. Um, in fact, I will say like the only one I wrote off is, we did, it was my last, like my last surgery I did before I went and it was a great client of ours. And unfortunately it was a kitty with a linear foreign body and it had perfed everywhere. And oh, man. So I just, you know, just, it didn't. And we were crying together. Like she's one of my greatest clients. Mm-hmm. And I just said, look, I don't care. Just don't even just write the whole thing. Off. Mm-hmm. But that, what I'm getting at is very rarely did we really do that. But people mm-hmm. that when we said, you know, just put, this down and but we were in a position to be able to do that Mm -hmm. you know and i think too you know we talk moral injury is that you know we had the autonomy to do those things and we weren't you know i enjoy being having a successful business and being able to do those good things because that allows us to do you know those things yeah and and so i i find that to be very rewarding like not finding it just right and our accounts receive like when we because i would keep I was like, where we are, you know, with accounts receivable, like making sure when was I going too far this way or, you know, just trying to keep Mm -hmm. myself in check. And we, we always did great. Like, Mm -hmm. and I was just really happy with that. And Mm -hmm. anyway, it's on my soapbox, but as, as people honoring that, that is when we talk about retention, we talk about that meant more to me. I mean, if I, if I was paid, I don't know, however much more to go somewhere else and I couldn't do, I would, I wouldn't go. Right. Right. I, I say, mean, if, it, like it, knowing it, that I had that backing. Yeah. Um, you know, from the owners or whatever. I mean, and again, that's why I stayed there for right. 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I was on a call the other day and uh, veterinary visionaries and there was a corporate person on there. And I said, yeah. I understand, you know, corporates, business, da, da, da. But when we are a purpose driven profession and all you do mm-hmm. is throw numbers at our heads, then mm-hmm. you are going to cause us to leave this profession because that's not who we are and it's not what we do and it's not why we do it. 
So we also need that autonomy to help. And that's why we all get into it. I mean, there's so many young veterinarians that I interview who actually want to do zoo or wildlife medicine because they want to save the environment. And that's part of what their motivation is. So if you say you can't save anything unless people have money or you can't be creative in figuring out how to help people, then, you know, they're not going to enjoy their work and they're not going to feel like they are living their purpose in life. And that automatically is going to drive people out to do other things. And it's part of our dilemma. Yeah. Well, this could get heavy. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I feel... But it's, oh, it's so, it's, it's so vital for us to know that that is, you know, in intellectual professions, how important purpose, meaning, growth, all of those things are. Like mm-hmm. there, when we look at reasons people, and Deloitte just put out a, a big study on, you know, why people are leaving. And I think, th- so they had all these, all these different categories and roughly, I don't have the number, in it, but I, I think 10 out of the 12 were all directly relatable to culture and psychological mm-hmm. safety. Yeah. It wasn't money, wasn't, I mean, money's not, I mean, of course, like, I mean, we want to be paid what we're worth, yeah. but we're, you know, we would all like, you know, I, I talked to my buddy this morning. He's a, he's a pulmonologist. I mean, that guy makes five times as much, but, but I wouldn't want to do what he, like, I love I love this. Like, yeah. I love being a veterinarian. Yeah. I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't want to, if I, I mean, if I wanted to be, I would have done something else. I sure. guess. But Absolutely. I just, I love, but, but honoring that we did that, like, and, mm-hmm. and what can we do on a day-to-day level to encourage that meaning and purpose, mm-hmm. um, you know, and how, how do we make that work? And sometimes it's, and that's where I hope like coming out with some of these retention numbers, at least give us some, you know, business. Cause we know, we know the data shows it. Um, intellectually, we know, you know, in our hearts, we know it, like, that's what keeps, keeps people, you know, in their position yeah. or one of, one of the things. It's one of the things. I mean, you know, people yeah. obviously salary has a lot to do with it and people need yeah. wages, but I have right. had to leave for, you know, more money and come back for culture because they go, yeah. we, you know, we can't work in this environment. These people are all mean right. and we, <laughs> we don't like yeah. it. If we want to come back, right. sure you can come back. But then even salary ends up being, it's, it's the one, you know, my training partner and I were talking this, it's like the downside is it's it, for a lot of companies, it's the one way you can show me how much I'm worth to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's wrapped up and I, so not, not discounting the living wage discussion, oh, yeah. but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, this is what, this is what I equate to your worth. And that's where too, if we're not doing reward and recognition and consistently giving good feedback and thank you for doing, you know, I saw what you did with that client. Yeah. You did, you know, you utilize these tools that I think, you know, you're really good at those things. Yeah. And I just yeah. wanted you to know, like I, we need to be doing those things as we do. and as team yeah. members. Yeah. yeah we yeah, do. So, you know, a lot anyhow, of, sorry, Debbie. Well, go. Oh, no, you're exactly like a lot of recognition yeah. there. I mean that, I think that people want to be recognized for good work and we're have a tendency again, going back to our brain defaults to negative to only talk about the negative things that people do and not be mm-hmm. conscious of looking at the positive things that people do. Right. And when I was a manager, I actually had this thing called pet points and you could get points and the points of course, translated to pet care for your own pets because we all own, yeah. you know, all reject animals come right. to veterinary professionals. <laughs> so you could get it, but you couldn't come to me and go, Hey Deb, you know, I need some pet points because I learned to do this right. new lab test. I would just go, well, that's great. I'm very proud that you learned a new skill. Somebody else on the team would have to come to me and go, hey, Deb, Sue learned how to do this new test. Uh, You need to give her points. Yeah. And I go, great. You know, so other people had to be consciously looking Mm -hmm. for a positive thing Mm -hmm. and then give me the heads up that these people deserve the points. And, and of course, then it became reciprocity, right? I mean, you gave me points. I need to be looking for things that you did so I can give you points. But when we're consciously looking for positive things rather than subconsciously finding negative by default, then we are building a team with a lot of self-esteem and mm-hmm. the ability to, as you said, feel safe and in, in going, hey, you know what? I 
made a mistake. I mean, I laugh mm -hmm. and I tell people I forgot to show up for work. I was the manager <laughs> and I <laughs> forgot to come to work one day and I was horrified at myself, but it was a Saturday and it was not a usual day yeah. for work. And I was filling in for somebody on vacation. I just mm -hmm. completely forgot about it. And at 10 o'clock, I called the practice. I went, oh my God, why didn't you guys call me? And she said, well, you know, kind of you're the boss. I went, no, I just screwed <laughs> up. You know, I just really did. So right. confess your sins, no matter where you are yeah. in this hierarchy, because then other people feel safe to confess their sins too. Yeah. And it's okay oh. to do that, right? Oh, and, um, and hunt the good stuff. Hunt the hunt good the stuff. That's good what we did at our prep. Hunt the good stuff. Yeah. Because we do have that negativity bias. And I say, you know, oh, you know, you go home and you're driving home. Everybody can remember the client that was crappy. To oh, them. yeah. Because oh. that's our default. Yeah. But if you if we make it a what went well when we go home and we share the things when we're on the lookout, like you said, we've got because we we have to train ourselves to mm -hmm. look for those things. And I'm saying like it's it's a six, seven, eight, 20 to one sometimes between good but we we default and the bad stuff sticks mm -hmm. and the good stuff's like teflon you know mm -hmm. it rolls off of us so exactly. we have to we have to bring it on yeah and there's way more way 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 more good stuff oh, you go and go on any of our websites or you know any clinic you know most most clinics you're gonna see 20 great reviews and you're gonna see one yeah. crappy review that's probably you know has more to do with where that person is spiritually yeah. than well, if you, you know, even if you're looking at the world today and yeah. everybody goes, oh my God, there's so much evil going on. People are crazy. People are shooting everybody, but 99% of people are great. You know, they really yeah. are kind. They do good things. Right. It's just the 1% that's making us all go, oh my God, making the it's falling life. apart. And yeah. we laugh because we say, oh, we need more good news. But the truth is we don't, we won't watch it. You know, we won't watch good yeah. news, but we need to be consciously seeking the good things that people do, mm -hmm. you know, how people are helping each other, how they helped each other all through the pandemic. And, and they did amazing yeah. things. Absolutely amazing things is, you know, voluntary people doing cool stuff. And, you know, I can imagine that the people at Pfizer, probably worked a lot of long, hard hours and put wow. tremendous effort yeah. into saving so yeah. many lives. And then yeah. they get crap, you know, and you want to go, but right. look at what they did. You know, this is kind of an amazing scientific feat in a short oh. period of time. And, and you and I get just having that conversation this oh. morning with somebody. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. And I think anybody who's in the science field really does yeah. understand how amazing it was to get that. Right done that fast and, and people are going to like, but what, what shortcuts and like all the paperwork went away. That's what happened. The government <laughs> crap yeah. went away because I've done clinical yeah. trials in my practice for companies yeah. who know what's involved <laughs> right, in the right. paperwork stuff and the delay yeah. in the paperwork. So basically there was no shortcut other than just bureaucratic BS that was cut right through to mm -hmm. get this stuff out for that. It was amazing stuff. Um, okay. So tell us a fun fact about you because we've been talking about a lot of the serious big yeah. stuff here. secret talent favorite song something people would be oh, to know. let's see um so i'm a big uh big, uh, big rush fan so the lost the drummer last year i think um and i i actually i was the 1995 uh nasa florida state powerlifting champion for my, no uh, way. For my weight class yeah yeah i used to be a personal trainer in that gap that i had i was telling yeah. you in school i actually had my personal trainer certification and worked at like the y and valleys and so like what that. was your what was your biggest weight how much did you lift? uh so i did um i set the state record for my it's, it's not, it doesn't sound like a lot now but it was five five seventy eight in the deadlift at oh 200, my word 220 pounds wow that's awesome yeah. that's amazing that's awesome. I, you know, I look at people who do that and go, "Oh my lord!" They're just listening to the brain. Uh, my hip, yeah, my my hips, my hips are uh, feeling it now. Uh, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> my um, uh, my husband was a um, weightlifter and yeah. worked out, and and he laid flooring for many many years in his youth, and it is oh, yeah. telling on him the joints and yeah. the arthritic arthritic back and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And so yeah, sometimes the 
the things that sound good when we're young, we will mm -hmm. pay for when we are yeah. old. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, anything any, to wrap up, anything you would like the listeners to know, um, how to reach out to you, we will put in the show notes a favorite book. We've talked about a couple. Um, any yeah. uh, shout out a person who just, you know, saved you, pulled you out of the fire, any of those good things. Oh, I mean, so Paul Jansen, Alex Soto, Nanette Wagner they're from Pershing Oaks Animal Hospital in Orlando. Like, God, God bless them. I, I love one of the things, you know, we were going to talk about most proud of, I was just most proud of the practice that, you know, we we built at a Country Oaks Animal Hospital and the team that's there. And they're just, they're just beautiful people. Like, I just love, love, love the relationship we had. And knowing that that is you know, every time I go into a different clinic, like you still can feel that vibe, you know, and that there's more, there's more beautiful things and more hope in veterinary medicine moving forward than, you know, it's it, the sky. There are things that we need to address with the skies and falling. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know? absolutely. I know it's, it's challenging, but it's, it's still the, the things that we hope for in veterinary medicine can and will be. They, they can, they can happen exactly right. But we, we yeah. have to make the change. We have to be willing yeah. to make the change. And that is yeah. a great way to end. So thank you yeah. so much for oh, joining me today you. on the bend. It's been a real pleasure. And I look forward to once again, seeing you at the Hyatt yeah, Bar. MX. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. I'm staying there uh, in, in. I already have my reservations. Yep. Yep. I already paid my registration to VMX. Yep. It was some kind of deal going. I went, why not? Oh, it was crazy. Yeah, yeah wasn't it? $125. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, I'm going to sign yeah. up before that goes away. So it's all set. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again. And we will have all your information available to the listeners. And I encourage them to, to seek you out. If you are out there in the world of uh, conference speaking and listen to what you have to say, because it's really important and it's going to be our way out of where we are in vet med and and so we truly will flourish.